Hi, and welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And we're going to be talking a lot about those last two things, innovation and politics, today with my guest, John Intine. He is the executive director and founder of the Genetic Literacy Project and an author of several books. John, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Great to be here, Robert. Um, let's go. Great. Um, so I warned you that uh, guests on this show introduce themselves. So uh, I, you have a long bio, a long CV. Um, imagine you've arrived somewhere and you have, say, 45 seconds to introduce yourself. You don't know anyone. Go. Yeah, my elevator summary, I guess. Uh, That's it. The elevator just started. <laughs> I'm a lifelong journalist. Um, I spent 20 years in network television at uh, ABC and NBC uh, in New York, uh, working for Primetime Live 2020. Tom Brokaw is a longtime producer, mostly focused on investigations of one kind or another. And at the end of my TV career, um, uh, uh, I uh, did a book. I did, excuse me. At the end of my TV career, I did a documentary on um, genetics and sports, a very controversial issue about black athletes and what are the genetic factors that contribute along with cultural factors. Very explosive documentary, but led to a book contract. And, and really, my dream was always to go into writing. So after many Emmy Awards and a lot of influence in, in television, um, I decided to move into writing, uh, focused during the, 2000, uh, the 1990s on sustainability issues, um, actually coined the term greenwashing as it's currently used. Um, and then um, beginning with my first book in 2000, working on the um, Tom Brokaw documentary called Taboo, Why Black Athletes Dominate Sports and Why We're Afraid to Talk About It, had a string of um, seven books, uh, Another on uh, religion, uh, the shared ancestry of Jews and Christians, uh, and the genetic factors that drive differences. Very unusual way to look at um, religion. Uh, and also got interested in agricultural biotechnology, uh, GMOs, controversy over chemicals in, in ag, chemophobia, trying to balance out dangers with benefits. Um, and then 10 years ago, launched um, what uh, is now a, 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 a pretty loud voice, I think, in the sustainability community. It's called Genetic Literacy Project, uh, geneticliteracyproject.org, a nonprofit foundation funded that focuses on human gene editing issues, similar to uh, disease issues, uh, coronavirus, uh, vaccine development, but mostly not just on information, but on denialism, like vaccine denialism, and then also on ag biotechnology, and again, focusing on the misinformation, who's getting it right, who's getting it wrong, and what are the political and environmental incentives for groups that both promote it and denigrate it. Sure. Well, you mentioned your your uh, your, your book uh, in passing, Abraham's Children, Race, Identity, and the DNA of the Chosen People. Um, there are a lot of things I want to talk about. And we <laughs> before we started talking about re recording, we talked about climate change and gene drive and genetic modification, gene genetic engineering. Um, but as I look at your, your work and that it, it, it seems to me, your, your, your book, the, the Abraham's children is the most personal one and, and that it, it relates to your mother dying of breast cancer. And then you find finding out that your sister carries the gene BRCA2, if I'm remembering yes. correctly, that is a, as is the marker or a gene that contributes to, or is linked to breast cancer. So a lot of, uh, uh, am I right to say that your interest in genetics is very much personal? Is, and if so, how do you explain that, if you don't mind? I think that's a good, way, a good place to start. Yeah, I think you have really um, um, captured what has driven a large part of my work. My mom, my aunt, and my grandmother all died in the, my senior year in high school, all within 16 months of each other. Um, no no time, kidding. So you, um, you, were, you were 18 when your mother died? 17? Uh, 17 and 18 when family members died. Uh, and it, it was all of breast or ovarian cancer. And we just thought it was the, you know, horrible, horrible, tragic luck, frankly. Um, but as we um, began to see uh, investigations and research into um, genetics and, and the causes of diseases, um, information unfolded that uh, a lot of the um, deaths in Ashkenazi Jews uh, related to ovarian and breast cancer were, were linked to three genes, two known as uh, uh, BRCA1 and one called BRCA2 which are, you know, sequences on the, um, on, on genes. And it ended up that my family died because they were Jewish, in essence. Uh, family members died. Ultimately, my sis, both of my sisters um, got breast cancer. Uh, both had mastectomies. And ultimately, one of my sisters just three years ago died of um, uh, pancreatic cancer, which is linked to the same BRCA 
mutation in my daughter. I'm a mixed marriage. My, my, my former wife is Christian, but she was unlucky enough to inherit um, the, the genetic mutation for breast and ovarian cancer as well. And, and, and I wanted to understand not only how genetics has become a driving force in disease and targeted specific groups, whether it's Jews or Amish or the Basque people or Iceland, all because of either cultural or geographical isolation in intermarriage. Um, but, but, but why we are afraid to talk about genetically based differences, which um, was really part of the reason I took up the sports and genetics. So it was really an extension, but actually something quite different um, at the same time. Well, so I, I have uh, uh, Abraham's children here. I have it on my Kindle. I didn't have time to get the uh, the uh, the hard hardcover copy, but it, it really is a very personal book in that regard. And I think you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on your work, and you know, don't claim to be. But the way you wrote it, it seems that it's an exploration not only of your family, but also just to, uh, well, how would I put it that you want to explore how you got to where you are and that there's a, that, that the motivation for what you do now with genetic literacy project, isn't just about, Oh, well, this is an interesting topic. There's, this is your own heritage as a Jew, as a, as a, as a science writer. And it brings all of those things together. And in, in, I mean, this is, is this one of the things that drives your work? Because I mean, you're, you know, when I look at genetically genetic literacy project.org website, I mean, it, you, you put a lot of effort into it. Is that what drives you that, that family history or is this something else at work? Very, very much so. But I would say that current, along with the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 69 years old. I'm an acid dropping hippie from the 60s. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, my, my parents wanted to me one of their nice Jewish son to be a doctor. Um, and I wanted to change the world. I was going to protest marches. And uh, that's what drove me into journalism. And it was really to be a crusading journalism, an investigative reporter and, and producer. Um, and, and, and any way that I could address issues, um, I, I've tried to do that. And that drew me into the agricultural part of what I'm interested in, because there's the issues of, um, how can a technology, which is often misunderstood, um, very, very revolutionary, and therefore it's disruptive, um, change the world. And then you add to that, the fact that it's a very personal experience with me as well. Um, it's really the catalyst, um, that, that. Uh, was behind my launching the GLP back in um, 2011. And it still motivates that uh, my interest today. And I, I write about differences. Look at COVID, for instance. Um, people are, are do, do not understand that the cold spot in the world for COVID is Africa. Why would Africa, the that youngest means- continent, that, that explains part of it, they're younger, but the worst healthcare system in the world, um, sub-Saharan Africa, below the, you know, the, the, the northern places, uh, in Africa is 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 by far um, with with no health care and no infrastructure of any kind, um, uh, you know, on, on the scale necessary to address something like this is a cold spot. And and, and the well, let's let's come large... let's come let's come back to that. I, you know, okay, I, I, do, I, I do I do interrupt a lot, John. So I didn't no, warn no, you I'm that sorry. I, I'm, I I'm, kind of, this uh, is this, going this on is, and on here. no. I know you're you're passionate about these issues, but um, let me before we get to the cold spot and i want to talk about covid and i want to talk about climate change and and i want to talk about how important this genetic engineering genetic modification transgenic use of transgenic technologies really are incredibly important now especially now but before you go there i just want to revisit the abraham's children uh uh and that book now which uh forgive me what how how many years ago did that come out i don't have uh, that right 2007 2000 so yeah, 14 still, years ago it's still in print as is the um the taboo book on black athletes, uh, right. which just came out in 2000 and 2000. Sure. So the, but uh, in Abraham's children, you, you tell this incredible story about father William Sanchez, um, who's a Catholic priest in New Mexico. It's a remarkable story. If you don't mind recount that, because to me, it was one of the things that in, in reading your book that it was, well, wow, this comes out of left field. Here's a, here's a, here's a, a Jewish journalist trying to track his own history. And yet somehow we're ending up in, in New Mexico with a bunch of uh, 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 people who are Catholics who are, who are descendants of Spaniards. But anyway, uh, go ahead if you don't mind, because I think that that, that story is just a remarkable one. Go ahead. Thank you. It was a, actually a remarkable story to me as well. If, if you go back in time to, to around the year 2000, 2001, right when the Human Genome Project was getting a lot of publicity with Francis Collins and cover of Time magazine, um, a, a few small um, uh, genetic ancestry organizations began popping up. Now we have 23andMe, of course, and Ancestry.com, but then there were none that were using 
genetics to track ancestry. And one started in Houston called Family Tree DNA. And a, um, a uh, Catholic priest um, uh, in Albuquerque called up the head of Family Tree DNA and said, I, I, you know, I'm really curious. I, 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 I want to get myself tested. And he ended up being sent a test um, by Family Tree DNA. And when he got the results back, Father Sanchez was flabbergasted and he called again back the, the, the head of Family Tree DNA and says these results came back and it says, um, you know, what, you know, it, it says that I might have some Jewish ancestries. He says, uh, well, uh, the guy from Family Tree DNA says, well, actually, it looks like um, you are descended from Jewish priests, that there are markers that we found um, on uh, there's there's a, a, a part of Judaism called the called the Kohanim, which is an ancestral priesthood, which is believed to be a genetic line, um, and it's there's stories about it all the way going back two thousand years. And he says you have the genetic markers that are common among Jewish Kohanim, among Jewish priests. Um, he says what could be, possibly be a, any connection? He says well I am a priest, maybe that has something to do with it. It was really remarkable, and he was astounded to find out that his family, when he went back into his own family history, were, were Spanish conversos who had come over um, in, in the end of the um, 1400s, the early um, 16th century, early 1500s, settled in northern Mexico, which was one of the expatriate converso populations, practiced their Judaism until Catholicism was really imposed on them, but retained all these um, uh, that was, I thought, one of the remarkable things that they were lighting candles on Friday nights in Catholic yeah, households. Sweep, sweeping that, dirt into the middle of the floor and all these things they had no idea. And now they've done testing and found out about 30 to 40 percent of the um, of, of the Spanish population in southern United States and northern Mexico are converted Jews who were uh, who, who ultimately were forcibly converted to um, Catholicism over the and, past three or 400 years. And, and wasn't it Sanchez is in his parish that there were several dozen people or and, and in his, his among his relatives, if memory serves here, that were that had the same blood or the same genetic uh, 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 ancestry. Is that right? Yeah, Am I remembering had, correctly? 27 family members who tested to have Jewish ancestry genes that normally occur only in Jewish populations. And I think 11 of them converted to Judaism. When I wrote the book, he was just in this bewildered state about what his identity was, and he has since left the um, priesthood and converted to Judaism because, as he says, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian by belief. I'm not shedding my belief in Jesus as my Savior, but Jesus was a Jew, and I want to acknowledge my Judaism because Judaism is a tribal religion. It's in my blood. It's in my genes. It's, faith is only a, a part of what it means to be a Jew, and I want to acknowledge and honor that. Yeah, that's it's just a remarkable story. I mean, just one that, uh, you know, I, I lived in New Mexico for a little while. And, you know, who would ever think, right? You know, all these very observant uh, Catholics would would be um, uh, would be uh, Jewish. You wrote in that book, you said, our genes carry meaning. I really like this part of it. You said this ancient script now being deciphered is literally lifting the curtain on God or nature's plan. Well, often at odds, religion and science are spinning an interlaced narrative of identity. Um but that idea of lifting the curtain, how far has the curtain been lifted in mm. when it comes to genetics? I mean, because in seeing some of what's happened, I mean, it does seem that this almost borders on magic. And yet it also, from what you've already said, we're maybe only in, the, if you're going to use a baseball analogy, now I've talked about curtains, let's use baseball <laughs> in a nine inning game. What inning are we in when it comes to these these genetic technologies and being able to change plants, change, you know, medicines, change us? How, how where are we in the game? Yeah, it's a, gr a great analogy. I'd say we're in the second inning, maybe. The second um, inning out of nine innings in, in terms of our cap in terms the of our ultimate this, this, this in terms of our ultimate capability to 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 manipulate or to engineer I, I don't know what the right word is but to to change our change genetics and the things that we need or we're just in two in the second inning out of nine is your your assessment yeah a lot of it is just understanding um, the power of genetics and I don't want to overstate this there's a danger. Um, of what is called genetic essentialism, where we reduce everything to genetic factors. And whether it's crops or humans or animals, we are, there, there's, we are a mixture of environmental, environmental and cultural factors, um, as well as genetic factors. So we don't want to overstate that, but we are 
we, we, you know, we are descended, we share an ancestry with not only animals, but plants. I mean, you, you can look in our DNA and there's plant, there's things that we share with almost every single plant in the world. Um, so we're just beginning to understand who and what makes us up. And the more we understand it, the more we can manipulate it, which is both good. We've seen um, eradication of genetic disorders, especially with this new process called gene editing. People have heard the term CRISPR, and we'll go into that a little bit, I'm assuming. Yes. Um, we can now um, literally eradicate um, diseases that have single genes that are causing them, like maybe Huntington's disease, where 100% of the people who have that um, gene die of it. But most disorders are a mixture of um, environmental factors, cultural factors, and genes themselves. So it's not the cure-all. It's not a magic bullet. It's it's one more um, step in the path of human understanding to um, lower the curtain on the mystery of life and death. So we're raising the curtain, lowering the curtain. We're, we got lots yeah. of curtains around here. That <laughs> well, so let's talk just briefly about taboo because I I I, I live in Austin, and I a while back I interviewed John Hoberman, who's written as well. He, he had a book called Darwin's Athletes. Um, and, and now Taboo, you said, grew out of some of your TV work. Give us a brief rundown of that book. And then and I want to talk about COVID and climate and the rest of these. But I think, you know, of the books that you've written, the ones that I thought were, you know, caught my eye were obviously Abraham's Children, which we talked about. Um, but what about Taboo and, and the site? And why did that book catch? Uh, or why was it so controversial? Yeah, I, I actually... Um uh, and it was published by Public Affairs, is that right? You're my, yeah, it's, which it's is published my, by, where my, the imprint that I've published my books. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I actually wrote Taboo um, uh, partly in response to and a challenging of John Hoberman's work because mm -hmm. I was honestly not a fan of it in many ways. John um, comes out of the postmodernist school. Um, I would call it the essentialist environmental school that m most things in the world are environmentally driven. And as I m you know, made the case before, Environment plays a huge role um, in, in, in many things. Um, but I was spurred on by um, the reaction to the documentary that Brokaw and I did in 1989 called Black Athletes Fact and Fiction, which stirred an international debate. It won Best um, International Sports Film and was the most highly rated documentary of the year. And I was just struck by how resistant people were to suggest that there could be population-based differences. It obviously opens up the Pandora's box of discussing Things like IQ differences. If you're saying that um, East and West Africans have different body types uh, that drive sports performance and success at the elite level, why might not that be applied um, to the mind? So that's the controversy, why we're afraid to talk about it. And taboo is, you know, maybe one third the story of genetic differences in um, that drive athletic um, patterns of sports at the elite level. Um, and the two thirds is really the history of race science, how how, if we're not careful, even my book could be misused by racists whose goal is not to illuminate, um, but to create a hierarchy of superiority and inferiority based on the, the natural variation that happens when genetic um, unfolds in d various parts of the world with different environmental factors. So it was a, a challenge to write something that was, in essence, in the big picture, potentially politically incorrect. and. In, in my case, I was warned it, it was going to end my career. People soberly looked me in the eye and say, this could be a very interesting book, but you'll never get to write again. But it did just the opposite. It, it did what I hoped it would do, which was to stir a very, fairly high level debate over the mix of environmental and social factors. Um, and actually, it, it, although there's certain factual um, things that have been updated, I think at the time um, I said there were 100,000 human genes. That's what they thought. Um, now we know that there may be 20, um, 20,000 human genes. So uh -huh. some of the, some of the facts are different, but the argument still holds. Um, and it's very, very powerful. If you want, we can discuss some of the, some of the fun and fascinating findings that we have. Well, so and I am interested in that, but we also want to keep this at about an hour and not, not, uh, try to f try to cover every issue. So yeah. let's, let's update to genetic literacy project. But before I do, I want to just point out on your Twitter handle, I believe, or your Twitter, I, you identify yourself as an iconoclast. Um, I like that word. I don't use it very often. What does that mean to you? And what is it? What, why, why do you refer your, to yourself that way? Well, or with uh, that, with that descriptor? I've, I, I think I've always been willing to, to push against the grain a little bit on my reporting, even as a um, television news producer and executive um, at, uh, at NBC and ABC. 
Um, because some people would say iconoclast means, well, you're just a contrarian. You're just a hard hit. I guess that would be sometimes that would be the, the other synonym that would go along with it, I guess is, uh, or some people would say that I think, you know, what's what popped into my head. Yeah. I mean, actually my, um, my, uh, Forbes had a, I had a column for quite some time at, at Forbes magazine called the contrarian. So perhaps your, yeah. your, uh, your <laughs> instinct is, is correct. Um, I guess what I like to do, I, I, I in, in my research and thinking about the world, I use a Greek um, concept called epoche, E-P-O-C-H-E, and it's linked to the phenomenologists of the early 20th century in philosophy. That was my major in college was philosophy. And it really means taking new ideas, taking ideas and framing them and doing your best because we're humans, we can't totally um, succeed at this, but try to drain out all the associations that a concept or an idea um, has and try to see it fresh as if you're bringing no prejudices to it at all. We can't, we're humans. We obviously bring ethical, social, historical baggage to it, but it's a technique that largely can work. And when you do that, you're surprised because it doesn't necessarily mean you reject past ideas, but you develop new folds of nuance to see things differently. And I think that's what I prided myself on. Um, like for instance, in the, in the 1980s, I worked on a documentary called He, She about male female differences. And I remember interviewing some um, female scientists, uh, all um, focused on a disease called con CAH disease, con congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is when um, females are born sometimes with male looking genitalia. And the reason is because of a genetic disorder that in causes testosterone to be released during embryonic um, development. And uh, they said they all were feminists of the 19, um, 80s, and they all rejected the idea that there was any genetic factors in male-female differences. You know, their idea was you give a give a give a little girl a, a a truck and a gun, and she'll identify with the same things that boys identify. You give boys dolls, and um, it, and then they said, you know, something we don't believe that anymore because we see through, through CAH disease people who had this testosterone that was um, affected the brain development. They're, they're, all their play characteristics and their behaviors and everything tracked along the male continuum. And they became what they call neo-feminists. We believe that there are differences that don't set up a hierarchy of better and worse, but we have to acknowledge our differences, whether it's um, which is you know, a lot of female. which are which are a lot of the issues now that are coming out with transgender athletes today with Castro exactly. Semenya and many other Roger Pilkey Jr. was on the podcast a few weeks ago talking about some of that uh, some of that work. In fact, that's really uh, some of the latest uh, reporting on that has shown that a lot of the the the, the science accepted science on that's just been flat wrong. Um, yes, it really um, opens up your eyes when you when you are willing to consider things in a nuanced kind of way. And you don't feel like you have to choose ideological camps. You don't choose environment is everything, genetics is everything. And try to understand how these how these differences play out in different cultural settings. So well, then, well, then let me, let me ask, of, well, let me ask you about that because you mentioned something that I think is interesting because as I looked at this and I thought, and, because I, I, I often say I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm, I'm just disgusted, right? I don't, I don't pick a political <laughs> party. How do you define your politics? I don't know. I, you know, I, I I, I would use the term progressive, though people tell me progressive means like the political, uh, the, the far left right now. And I don't consider myself a, f a far leftist. I mean, I have to be honest, I voted except for <laughs> Rudolph Giuliani in his first um, campaign in New York when he was considered nonpartisan. I think I voted Democrat my entire life and, and definitely see the world through the, the lens of, 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 of wanting to see a, a social betterment. Um, uh, you know, I'm not aggressively political. If you go on the GLP website, even today, we have an article slamming misreporting on Fox News about uh, COVID vaccines, for instance. Right. Um, but we've also come down really hard on like the New York Times has been of the major um, journalistic organs has has been one of the worst on reporting on on crop biotechnology. So so-called GMOs. They recently had a cover story in The New York Times about learning to love GMOs, which is basically a repudiation of about 20 years of of, uh, of, of really vapid reporting by The New York Times. So we're not afraid at the GLP reflecting my personality, but also the independence of the journalist. We, we go where we think the evidence takes us. And if it ends up t taking down Monsanto because it misuses dicamba and, and rolled it out, uh, recklessly and hurt a lot of farmers or um, going after anti-biotechnology activists and the environmental movement, which has come very, become very sclerotic and very anti-technology 
whether it's talking about nuclear energy or talking about um, crop biotechnology. Right. Well, let's come back to that uh, because, well, I just one last thought on that uh, in terms of the, 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 the environmental groups or the pressure groups that are anti-GMO. But I just note that your your piece. Let, let's go back to the uh, to COVID. We started there about the COVID co- uh, cold spot, and you published that. Uh, I think in both essays, long ones, um, with a colleague of yours in Quillette, which is uh, certainly not something that would. I remember, in fact, we were in California a few weeks ago with the Breakthrough Institute, and some guy was saying, "Oh yeah, they're just white nationalists. They're a bunch of Nazi." I mean, at Quillette, he's talking about it. And I'm thinking, have you ever read it? I mean, you know. But it, so you published that in Quillette because that's an international news uh, news outlet uh, but it's also one that's not ever identified with the left as far as i can tell well it's not identified with the right if people are familiar with quillette it's basically i, I think in some ways ref- reflects that iconoclastic view yeah um that, that 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 is willing to to go where the evidence is um there are articles on there that frankly mimic something you'd find in the most pc um journals in in the united states but it also is willing to 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 take up uncomfortable positions and to me, well, that's that's what I think is what, what, what drove my interest in having it co- co-printed in, in the Genetic Literacy Project, as well as in Quillette. I thought I, I thought I hit a chord with a different audience. Yeah. Good. So let's talk about the, the piece that you had in Quillette and in, in GLP. And uh, my guest, just a reminder uh, very quickly, is John Intine. He's the executive director of the Genetic Literacy Project. You can find them at geneticliteracyproject.org. Um, that essay you published just a few weeks ago on the cold spot in Africa when it comes to COVID, um, that the, as a continent, it has not been affected to, de- to nearly the degree that North America, Europe, uh, Asia has been hit. Um, cut to the chase here. Why? Why is why hasn't COVID taken the toll in Africa that it's taken elsewhere? Well, like any story, it's it's complicated, <laughs> um, and uh, whenever you talk about genetics, you you also always have to say environment in the same breath. So the cultural and environmental factors that are clear are a young population, average age is nineteen. I think the average age in the United States is in the forties. Germany, it's in the high forties, maybe early fifties. So obviously, older populations are more more vulnerable, more comorbidities, issues of of that kind. And and um, just to be clear, so you're saying there, and, and and I just want to repeat this because I think. It's, it's something I've heard before, I've heard or referenced before, but yeah. there are roughly 1.1, 1.2 billion Africans and on the continent. And then the average age is 19, which 19. has Correct. implications for a whole lot of things, into, including demographics, population growth, energy demand, food demand, all, all kinds of things. But anyway, I just so yeah, it, please continue. Sure. So that's a major cultural, I mean, cultural environmental driver of the low numbers. But it also has, as I referenced before, one of the worst um, health infrastructures of any place in the world. Um, and, and so the, the numbers, the age numbers alone can't explain it because there are other countries, as I addressed in that article, um, that also have very uh, a, a low average population that have really been hit extremely hard by COVID. So what explains it? So I um, actually f- found that there was a University of Hawaii professor. She's quite well known in her field, which was looking at genetic factors that could explain it. And when you look at other coronaviruses um, and also the impact of diseases on various populations, other diseases, you see that that, that different populations are affected by different diseases at different rates um, substantially because of, 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 of their genetics. And she was starting to look at all these cofactors and I began to see probably there were 15 or 20 examples over time of genetic differences in which people of sub-Saharan African ancestry um, uh, did not have a, 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 um, as, as high an incidence of other kinds of coronaviruses or other health impacts. So this was a supposition. It was in accord with her research, which is still ongoing. And it's actually, I think what fascinated me was not that this is going on. I was just fascinated by the fact that Again, like taboo, we're not talking about genetic differences as if it's a subject that we don't want to discuss at the population-based level because of the P- Pandora box issues. What, what, other, what other issues might be related to, um, to population? But if we're really truly wanting to address coronaviruses and other diseases in the future, we have to unpack this because the solutions ultimately might not be a vaccine. It might be genetic tweaking um, that will allow us to replicate some of the factors that exist in, in, in Africans. But as I said in the article, there are other diseases that impact other populations more or less p- 
purely on the basis of their genetics, whether it's Irish claw disease, which affects the Irish, or Ashkenazi or, or, Jews affected or, by or, or uh, breast, breast cancer. Breast cancer, BRCA2, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so it's really, the implications of this are far beyond the coronavirus, as absolutely immense as the implications in that area might be. It's really will help inform us um, uh, in, 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 in addressing a, a, a panoply of other potential threats um, to humanity. Well, so let's broaden that out because I, I, one of the things that, that we talked about before we started recording was what what um, what are going to be the most impactful parts of the genetic um, um, the genetic liter I'm not going to say the genetic literacy. What's the right term of art here? But the different technologies that that uh, our ability to to locate, identify, change, engineer uh, uh, genes. What are the ones that are the most important now? We, you mentioned CRISPR in passing. We talked about gene editing, genetic uh, modification, and then you mentioned something I hadn't heard of before called gene drive. So handicap this for me, and I'm a layman, and you know, at all of this, and I'm a layman, and I'm a sophomore on pretty much everything in <laughs> touch. But what would it handicap the technologies in terms of genetic engineering, genetic modification? Which ones are the most important? Have had the most impact, and which ones are going to have the most impact in the in the future? Yeah, great question. You know, I think our biggest challenge is climate change. Uh, it really is. It infects um, so much of the of, of the horrible parts of, of what's going on in the world today. Um, climate change is driving agricultural production, some cases positively, but in most cases negatively. Um, it's increasing. Uh, uh, it, it's impacting increase in diseases because um, uh, d uh, certain kinds of insects that are uh, disease carrying, um, whether it's malaria, malaria. Uh, being carried um, uh, by um, mosquitoes and Zika, things of those kinds, uh, is very impactful in, in, in that way. Um, food production is being uh, affected dramatically by, by, by climate change. There's just so many, many issues in the agricultural and, and medical field um, that we need new technologies to deal with this. We all know that we want to reduce the impact um, of, of uh, human activity in the world. One of the single biggest areas is agricultural um, impact. 20% of climate change dislocation is probably caused by agriculture. Yet, as you mentioned, Africa is, they're 19 year olds. Um, they're they're, they're, they're going to have families. African population is going to increase. The average caloric intake of Africans is 900 calories. It's been creeping up from 700 calories. We'll go up to 15, 1600 over the next 30 years. Um, we're going to have to have a 50% if, or more increase in food production, we have no more arable land left in the world. How are we going to get there? We need new techniques. The new techniques are genetic uh, editing, uh, CRISPR, which uh, you work within the genome of a particular plant or animal and making tweaks on it, everything from increasing yield to decreasing um, potential diseases. Um, we have traditional GMOs, which has been vilified, I think unfairly, but we have this new technique called gene drives, and that addresses a panoply of things. Gene drives is when you um, uh, you look at an issue. We'll, we'll use um, uh, mosquitoes that carry lots of vector, lots of diseases. You actually can um, uh, either using gene editing or GMO technology um, tweak uh, a population of um, disease-carrying mosquitoes, put them into the population, maybe alter their genes so they only produce males, that there's no females. When they, when, when, they, when they breed, and then ultimately these um, Zika-carrying mosquitoes die out because they can't breed. This has been, technology has been developed. It's been released in Brazil. Two months ago, it was released in the Florida Keys because of the high increases of, of dengue and Zika and other diseases there. Huh. It's being um, discussed with the California um, uh, Health and Agricultural Authorities about releasing it there. I mean, it's, it's a very controversial because you are so, literally... So if I can interrupt, so the Florida, I wasn't aware of this, but, you know, that, I mean, mosquitoes, are, this has been an issue for for humans for hundreds of years with malaria yeah. and the rest of it. But I wasn't aware of what was going on in Florida. So there have been a, this is a pilot, is it, who's doing it in Florida? Do you know the entity that's carrying it out? Yeah, they, uh, well, the, the Florida Department of Health is doing it, supported by... Okay. Um, by uh, both the FDA and the USDA, who have who have long studied this technology, there's a, a company, um, uh, the vanguard of, of this technology is called Oxitec, O X I T E C, based in based in the UK, um, uh, and it's. But there are many um, kinds of gene drives being developed, not only to potentially eliminate 
vector carrying diseases, whether it's rodents in Australia or mosquitoes in Brazil, we also now can, are using gene drives to um, put them in, 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 in plant um, in, in agricultural settings to rid us of, of my, microbes, disease microbes that, that, that essentially can destroy. Uh, for instance, right now we, we have the banana population, um, uh, the, the bananas that we eat, 98% of them are under threats by disease carrying, um, uh, by, by disease carrying pathogens that could be, uh, you okay? <laughs> that, yes, that thanks. Could be addressed um, using gene drives. So it's a really cutting edge technology. And, and just to inter and just to interrupt you, you because you had something on genetically literacy project org website about this the jubilee the jubilee strain of, of, of bananas you're saying is is threatened because of uh, a new pest. Is that did I hear you right? Yeah. Well, there's that, been uh, it's, it's been going on for about 20, 30 years. That okay. The, the, the major uh, you know the, the the bananas that we eat right now is uh, if you go back. 100 years was not the bananas we were eating then. The bananas we were eating then were wiped out by, um, by diseases, banana diseases. And it was replaced by the current type of um, bananas that, that, that are grown and that we see both in Europe and the United States. But there's a, there's a disease pest that is spreading dramatically. And there's no known way of, 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 um, of addressing it. The only ways are genetic, whether it's through gene editing, or it's through gene drives that can be potentially used to um, eradicate these diseases. And, but and, 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 and the drives, just to be clear, John, I, I, so it's a way of, of genetic that it, then for the instance, the mosquitoes that you somehow you change the genetic code so that the offspring are just one species one, or one, one, one sex, the male. So well, that's what it is for. Yeah, that's what it is for mosquitoes. So they don't propagate. Right. So yeah. if they're not if they're not propagating, they can't be spreading it. But we also can do it on plants as well. So you're not propagating the the the, the bacteria. Oh, I see. So you, so you edit out the gene for a certain susceptibility, perhaps, or you edit yeah. out for if you did it in humans, you do edit out the 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 BRCA two gene or the BRCA gene or, or gene, what? gene drives refers to driving a genetic change through an entire population. So I you see. use CRISPR. And you use GMOs, and this is a method for spreading it into the population, so it has a dramatic and widespread effect in a short time. But listen, you are, you are in some cases, like in, in the case of the disease-carrying mosquito, you could be ending a species. And so the critics of it have jumped on this. The anti-biotechnology industry, which grew up on GMOs, has now switched to things like gene editing and specifically targeted gene drives, saying, oh, you're destroying... A, a you know a population and then they do the butterfly effect uh, the idea that you know a, a, well, I'm, a I'm all in favor I'm all in favor of getting rid of mosquitoes I don't well, I, scientists yeah. have looked at this um, <laughs> and, and it, you know there 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 are literally tens of thousands of of uh, populations um, that are ended every year and millions that are created every year so it's really not an issue from a science point of view it's it's a it's a political ideological wedge used by anti biotechnology groups. So I want to come back to the anti-biotech groups, but I also just want to, I, I, I interviewed Pamela Ronald, who you know is a, a, a gene, plant geneticist at the University of California, Davis, and we talked about CRISPR, which I, it's a common acronym, but I, I looked it up, Clusters of Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Which I'm only you know only heard of palindromes in in English class, right? Bob yeah. and radar and the rest of it. But but this is referring to the genetic sequence uh, that and and those those sequences that repeat themselves. So that CRISPR is a method. Uh, it refers to gene editing and 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 editing out parts of those different sequences as 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 d demanded by the the goal. Right? Is that fair? Yes, yeah, so I think you've said it. I mean, it's hard for people to wrap their head around it, but essentially, we know. Um, and we know this from studying nature, um, that uh, individual um, um, genes um, can carry, carry messages. The RNA is carried in, uh, as, a, as a messenger that tells genes what to do. And if a gene is, is doing something deleterious and you change the message, then it's not going to do that deleterious impact. Um, this happens in nature all the time. They're natural mutations. We are all the product of natural mutations. Every single plant that's born is a is a new mutation. Um, and so but basically what you're doing is harnessing what nature already does. One of the reasons gene editing CRISPR does, has not faced the regulatory um, um, 
uh, schemata, the, the, the challenges that GMOs have faced is that GMO is not exactly how nature happens. There, there, there are some similarities to it, but generally you, you could take a, a, a gene from one species and put it in another um, and, and create the impact that way. It sounds scary, but in fact, as I mentioned earlier, we are all the product of many genes, including plant genes. But a gene editing takes away that argument um, because it work, works within the genome of that species itself. So I you're see. either deleting something or you're adding something. And, but, and, um, but you're not bringing a gene from some other uh, yeah. some other organism and inserting it then. Exactly. So it's, it's less you. controversial. I, I think it's a specious difference. It's a, it's a difference without a real with a real impact. But but it's um, the anti-GMO industry was built on the mm, the Franken Franken gene. Uh, right, Franken food. Right, yeah. And that's right. the idea of moving a gene from one species to another. They can't play the Franken gene card, so now they're playing other scare tactics. Well, let's talk about one of the things that was, in fact, I read about on on the Genetic Literacy Project website about a transgenic maize variety in Africa. And if you don't mind, uh, transgenic. What does that mean? Transgenic is what, what what that's moving a gene from one from one species to another. A GMO. Okay. Is what's called a transgene. And a um, gene editing is what is called a cis, C-I-S gene. And it means uh, operating within the genome itself. They're, these are more technical terms. Gotcha. So uh, uh, the, but in the, the, the article that I'm referring to, uh, I'll read this because it, to, it, to me it's just remarkable. The data from the third confined field trial of the TELA maize project, T-E-L-A maize project, that is being carried out at the Institute for Agricultural Research, Samaru, has shown that the variety produces nine tons per hectare as against three tons by the best producing maize in Nigeria. Uh, the, the, the variety is also resistant to, st to stem borers and fall armyworm. I mean, this is just, and, and I talked a little bit about this with Pamela Ronald when she was on the podcast, but that just sounds amazing. A 3x increase in output. I mean, is this something that we can expect now that this is going to become more common? Because... I mean, I'm used to you know, changes in efficiency in like automobiles. Oh, well, we got a 15% increase in efficiency or, or a, a single digit increase in efficiency of, in any kind of machinery, but a 300% increase. I mean, this isn't, it's, that's truly incredible. Is, is that going to work? Is that going to, can that, can that scale now? Tell me about that. Well, I, I think we were, we, meaning the people like myself who follow this were frankly as startled as you are because the um, historically, Transgenics, GMOs, have um, helped increase yields by maybe 7 to 20% over the right. years, mostly not by tweaking um, yield production itself by lowering the impact of diseases, let's say. So yield has increased as a result of other factors rather than the, the, the holy grail has always been, can you increase yield itself? And up until the last year, we haven't um, been able to address that now and literally the past Three or four months, there's been a slew of academic studies that have come out, including the one that you're suggesting, that um, raise the possibility of a, a, a tectonic change in the way we think about the impact of transgenics and gene editing. Um, so all I can tell you is that the, the genetics world is, is, is as startled as you are. This obviously has to be replicated. It's a trial. Um, but even in the past month, um, a, a series of studies, a large article in Smithsonian Magazine based on a nature biotechnology research showed that you could take a human um, protein uh, gene and put it in rice or potatoes or uh, wheat, lentils, and increase uh, yield by 50%, which also itself would be an incredible... Just, just an incredible when you think about the cereal grains alone, rice and, and, yeah. and corn and wheat. I mean, a 50% increase. I mean, this is just... It, 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 you know, it's it's funny because I think about all these things in terms of well, Malthus, right? Well, you know, Malthus been proven wrong for a long since 1776, <laughs> right? But it's he's on the verge of being true, proven wrong on a, in a on a scale that even through Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution and all the things that we've seen so far, it, it it's maybe we ha we ain't seen nothing yet. Is that a fair assessment? I I think it is, and it really points to. The difference between what, what I would call the techno optimists, who I really should say call them techno realists, versus old line environmentalists, who are, who are very fearful of um, the role of, of, of technology as a potential solution to environmental challenges like um, uh, pesticide um, overuse or um, uh, energy uh, problems. Th th their idea is let's cut back. 
Um, let's uh, restrict um, use, use of less, re- use less, reduce mobility. Exactly. You know, and, uh, and then there's the the whole. Uh, you know, we met at the Breakthrough Institute. And yeah. That, that they believe that technology used appropriately, while not a while not a silver bullet, can actually be a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And whether it means using nuclear energy um, to produce clean energy, um, which is scalable. Uh, which the old line environmental movement rejects out of hand based on, um, you know, Chernobyl and 1980s views of the technology. But that also applies to biotechnology as well, that that rather than um, um, saying that we uh, should move to organics, or, organics doesn't increase yield. Actually, organic agriculture, as beneficial it has done to focus our attention on issues such as soil quality preservation, it has a 45% yield lag with no more arable land in the world. Um, the only way you're going to increase um, land to feed Africans and Asians whose caloric in- you know, intake is increasing and the numbers of their population are increasing is by clear cutting the Amazon or other forests. So we need technological solutions. And this is like, uh, c- could not be better news. These are not ready for prime time, um, but there's no reason to think that within a decade or so, many of these products, maybe less, um, will be rolled out and begin to be part of a comprehensive climate change solution, which I, I think we need to we, we need to develop. Well, I think it's interesting you say that because as, as I mentioned, I, I had inter- I've interviewed uh, Pamela Ronald and, and she developed a flood and with other people, other colleagues, flood resistant form of rice. And the in her TED talk, she showed the, you know, the, the, the time lapse video of that growing. And it was like magic. I mean, and I told her, I said, it's just incredible that, that yeah. they could develop this technology by, by looking at strains of rice and then inserting them um, in, um, in, in editing them into other strains of rice and then achieve this now technology that in a span of a few years is now being re- used by something like six or seven million farmers. I mean, it's just exactly. an inc- incredible amount of progress. We now it, have drought resistant rice too, which we need because of climate change dis- dislocations of other kinds. Right. Yeah, it's, it's well, so good. so let's talk about you touched on this a minute ago, John, about these groups uh, and, and uh, you know, we're on a podcast. Name them. Who are these these entities? What are these entities that, as I look at it, they're anti hydrocarbons, they're anti nuclear and they're anti genetic modification of anything. Who is this? And so name names and tell me what's the motivation? What are the what what is this? Where is this bias coming from that is anti-technology, anti-modern? I would say it's even anti-modernism and there's smacks of anti-humanism as well. That's my view. So what's, what is the unifying worldview here and who is it and, who, and how much money are they getting and from who? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, those are big questions. <laughs> these are important, important questions to ask, but let's flip it before I address that. To say, sure. Who are the environmental groups that are actually – thinking at a high level. And obviously you have groups like the Breakthrough Institute, but their, their, their impact is small because at this point they're still, um, you know, represent a tiny faction of people on these issues. But you have and, some- And, and, relative, and relatively small groups themselves. I mean, they're, you know, their staffs are, you know, a few 10, you know, 10 or maybe 20 people. They're not, they're not big organizations that are promoting this- Exactly. Uh, a, 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 a positive and, and, and pro-human view of the future. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, but you have you have large envir- uh, groups like the Environmental Defense Fund, which is a very smart, solution-focused organization. Grew out of the, um, uh, I think maybe with the first organization to, to to legally start challenging corporations and others for their polluting back in the 1970s, um, and were part of the uh, reasons why we have a Environmental Protection Agency. That that's an ag- that's an organization that's looking at, at all technologies. And having an open mind and saying what works and what doesn't work, and 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 they are reframing the debate rather than a technology is bad or good, and saying what are the trade-offs? Everything has a downside to it. Um, are we creating more problems by um, introducing this technology or not? So I would say EDF is a problem solver. World Wild, Wildlife um, uh, Foundation is is another one that is interested in solving uh, problems. Um, uh, Nature Conservancy is, is another one. So I don't want to dish environmental groups because many of them recognize we, we, we have to take a, a different view. But there's a, a, a lot of what I would call old line environmentalists, which are still rooted in um, an anti-corporate viewpoint that anything where a, a technology has a, um, a was developed by corporations is, is, is viewed with something between 
um, suspicion and disdain and often off the table. Um, or they also have this backward looking um, catastrophic uh, view of the world. And I, they, they do promote catastrophism. The sky is falling and it's become a fundamental fundraising tool for, for, for what they do. And I would put groups that some people believe have a great reputation and they do do certain things very well. So you don't want to paint the whole organization. It's on certain topics. But I would say NRDC um, um, is, is one of the worst in this. Um, I would say Center is, for is, is one of is one of the worst in 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 in, in promoting in, misinformation, in, in fear fear mongering and, and fear promoting. Mongering. Yeah, they do it on chemicals. They do it on um, uh, biotechnology. They do it on um, uh, nuclear energy. Um, they, they are not solution minded. They have certain topics that are off the table. Sierra Club, you and I were at a meeting uh, in, in, the, in the Breakthrough Institute and got into a conversation with a person from the Sierra Club who, who turns out their magazines. And he said they won't even talk about nuclear energy as a potential solution. It is, a, it is an untouchable subject. So they won't even engage the new science on it. Uh, the use of um, a biotechnology. He, he didn't. He did, I noticed he didn't reply to the, we're talking about someone we met at the Sierra, who's with Sierra Club. Noticed he didn't reply to your email when I emailed him with information about the backlash against renewable energy signing. He didn't. Re, he didn't reply to me either. So apparently that's off the table. But that's a different discussion. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> that's the discouraging part. It's uh, a lot of these mainline groups. Um, a pesticide action network, for instance. It's it's one thing to say a pesticide is problematic and potentially we should regulate it in a stricter way. No one who understands technology would say that if we have new information about the impact of a of an input that we shouldn't restrict it. But but wh when do you want to ban it? You only want to ban it when what replaces it is actually safer rather than worse. So you need to do cost benefit analysis, which is something that, that I would say the far environmental left is um, doing cost benefit analysis is an anathema. The early iteration of the um, of the um, precautionary principle, which was first introduced in the late 1980s, early 90s, ha had a, a cost benefit clause built into it, but it was pushed out by activists in the late 1990s. And now there's a push by many countries which have adopted that philosophy to ban things, even when things that will replace it are worse than what was banned. I'm a realist. I want to see change. Sometimes change is dramatic, but often change is incremental. And, and I do see technology evolving. And I do see in certain areas, like addressing chemical inputs in, in agriculture, like addressing nuclear energy uh, as, a, as a potential, um, as one potential arrow uh, uh, in, in, in the quill to fight um, climate change issues. We, we have to consider the benefits against the potential negatives. And but, I think but what, but, nuclear. But, so just to, so just to just to so the murderers row if you're going to name you you mentioned the Natural Resource Defense Council if you don't mind who are the other groups on that list that you think yeah. are the ones the big the would we would you call them promoters of disinformation or or, or fear mongering how do how do you couch that yeah I mean there, there's a group called the um, uh, Env Env Environmental Working Group and Center for Food Safety. Uh, both of them, especially EWG, promotes what's called the dirty dozen every year, which they say are the, the dozen fruits and vegetables which have the most chemicals on it, all of which are perfectly safe. And, they, and, and their, um, uh, their, their propaganda has been denounced by others. But we at the GLP put, put out our dirty dozen uh, and we listed the environmental organizations like um, Pesticide Action Network, um, like I said, Environmental Working Group, Center for Food Safety, um, uh, Greenpeace, Sierra Club. Um, uh, and, and, and literally a, a lot of others as you go, something called Via Campesina, which sounds like it's a, a wonderful organization because it promotes indigenous rights, but it promotes indigenous rights by trying to lock them into technologies that are outdated and actually are more pr uh, uh, problematic than cutting edge technologies. So groups that I think their intentions are good. Um, I think their solutions are, 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 are in many cases anti-science or science rejectionists. And again, the, 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 the secret sauce for a lot of these organizations is that catastrophism raises money and uh -huh. they are businesses of their own kind. And so it, it, it does nothing to say we have a potential solution that might incrementally increase the benefits to society. Um, that doesn't score, that doesn't raise money for the Sierra Club. So instead they say um, insects are dying around the world. And we have face a catastrophe and we're going to have an insect Armageddon. Well, entomologists don't believe that. 
Um, but that doesn't stop the New York Times from doing a, a New York Times magazine cover story on this three years ago that literally created the insect Armageddon movement that has dogged environmentalism for the past three years that um, and still is something entomologists are fighting tooth and nail and saying we got to be more um, um, direct and understanding about where the problems are and what we can do. Creating this catastrophism basically um, creates a, also a reaction among um, among the science rejectionists on the far right who say, well, if it's catastrophic, if climate change is, is going to happen by the end of the um, by the end of the decade and there's nothing we could do, well, we're not going to spend money on it. You have to be realistic and, 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 and present solutions that actually can move the meter and also ultimately open the, open, open the minds of people to do more dramatic um, um, innovation. Um, sure. And I think that the, these organizations are really the opponents of the very um, technologies that could really help the people that they claim to be um, fighting on their behalf. And what's the rationale, though? Just I don't want to spend a whole lot of time more on these groups, and because I, you know, I, I, I just find it a lot of it just distasteful because I think they're. But what's the, you know, when it comes to uh, opposed to hydrocarbons, opposed to nuclear, opposed to GM, GMOs or genetic engineering, and what's the is it is it anti? You said anti-capitalist, anti-corporate. Is there something else though? It's just oh, we're against the man, or is is there something else that I mean? Is there some other unifying? belief system that that is driving these these groups well or is it just uh, campaigning and money raising is that is no, that i definitely don't think it's just campaigning and money raising. I, I have not found an activist who i disagree with in, in a fundamental way like this who's purely doing it for greed except for maybe an individual here and there right most of these groups have um you know ha, ha, have drunk the kool-aid they really believe that they are fighting for humanity um, and so that justifies using tactics that you and I would find unsavory. Greenpeace um, has admitted that its tactic of of um, of, of creating um, uh, uh, a, a sense of fear about an Armageddon-like problem in in any issue really, really is the is is the secret sauce to their fundraising. And and I do think a lot of these groups are legacy groups from from again my culture growing up, the baby boom culture, which believes that. Um, uh, governments have been corrupted by big business, that big business has, has infiltrated and undermined environmental protection, um, that there, this is part of the international movement led by people like Bill Gates, and Bill Gates is vilified on the left as much as he's vilified on the right. Um, uh, so it's a combination of cultural um, and ideological factors, and it has the benefit is, is that it also raises money to keep these organizations not only... Um, uh, uh, able to uh, uh, perpetrate their pop propaganda, but to grow and increase their footprint. So they are businesses, just right. like um, uh, Monsanto or DuPont or Syngenta is a business, and they operate as businesses operate, blindly, um, sometimes in the public good, but often not. That's a, that's a good, I, I, I like the way you summarize that. So um, one of the other things in, in looking up, uh, you know, doing some research ahead of this, we were both in the film Frack Nation, which appeared a few years ago, uh, which was done by uh, 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 Anne McElhenney and uh, Phelan McAleer. Um, uh, and you called at that in that interview, you really hammered the New York Times and you've hammered him a couple of times. You mentioned him already here. Um, uh, and but that was about uh, the shale gas revolution and the reporting that was done by Ian Urbina, if memory serves, in the New York Times. And you just said that they got it completely wrong. Um, it, there's it's easy to pick on the New York Times and a lot of people do it. But is is there in, in your view as a, in general, has their science coverage been been very good? Their coverage on climate change. How do you view that as? as a media outlet in terms of where your, you know, your, your, your field of work, how do you assess them? And is it getting better or worse? And is it just a standard that uh, it might not be very good overall in, in terms of big media outlets? I think it's one of the best newspapers, if not the best newspaper in the world. So I, I, I don't want to, this is not an attack on the New York times per se. Sure. A lot of the criticisms I have are, are challenges of individual reporters like Ian Urbana and his reporting was later roundly discredited and he was actually, um, taken off that beat in part because other people came through after I think I started the ball rolling. Um, and ultimately articles are articles by individuals and um, blessed by editors. And I don't think there's an institutional bias um, in general. I think there's what you might call liberal bias of the New York Times, just like there is 
for the Washington Post. I think the Wall Street Journal's um, non-editorial pages are, are, are even have a slight liberal bias, um, to be honest. Um, so I don't think there's a conspiracy here. The New York Times is a trusted organization, covers most science articles with resources that are um, beyond um, the scope of, of almost any organization in the world. So the last thing I want to do is is um, discredit them in the broadest sense. But I do want to point out that no one should be immune um, uh, from, from criticism. And, and that just because citing the New York Times and saying, well, the New York Times says is no better than saying Fox News says, not because Fox News is is a, um, a right-wing journal, because the New York Times doesn't say it. An individual writer says it. Um, right. and, and it somehow makes its way through an editorial process that is human and flawed. And I think the, the, the coming out party on GMOs was, um, was really stated by the New York Times uh, cover story a month ago saying, you know, rethinking GMOs, that maybe it's the solution and not the problem. It, it, it took them 20 years to do it, um, but they're finally, they're, they're finally doing it. So I don't think there's a conspiracy. I do think it's a wonderful newspaper and I do trust it. And I read it every day along with the Washington Post, the, New, um, the Wall Street Journal and a slew of other um, environmental um, journals to find out what's going on in, in technology um, innovation. Well, you beat me to the one of the questions I want to ask you. So then in, in terms of um, uh, in, uh, science in general, but I would say it, uh, your, your, your main beat, genetic literacy, which publications do the best job? Hmm. Um, I, I, you know, our job is not to report on the science. It's to report on misinformation and um, the ideological um, and uh, sometimes uh, financial incentives um, of the disinformation industry. And I don't think anybody does what we do on the scale that we do it. So we kind of, without tooting our own horn too loud, I mean, we, I, I remember the first day we, we start, launched the GLP, um, we were not our failure. I mean, we had 26 visitors and 25 of those were me checking the website. Um, <laughs> we, we've had days in the past month that we've had 80,000 um, unique visitors on one day. And our, our information is picked up um, when, when I did the Quillette article, which was also, like I said, co-published on the GLP, it was cited in, in a debate in the House of Lords um, on this very, very issue. Um, so there's a lot of people out there who are fighting misinformation in their own way. People like Stephen Novella, who has a column, um, Neurologica, um, um, a, a slew of, of very, I think, impassioned um, uh, science um, misinformation challengers. And um, so you, you really have to comb the internet and, uh, and, and find sources um, that, that are focused on this, on this. But what we do at the GLP is not only are we publishing our own articles and we welcome articles, we've welcomed articles from people like Civil Eats, who we finally disagree with because they're really an organic promoting organization, uh, because we believe in diverse ideological perspectives if it's science grounded. But we also collate from the web 10 to 12 articles a day. So we're actually a pretty good source for saying, where is interesting um, research um, uh, coming out of? Who, who are the ones who are pushing back against um, misinformation and disinformation? Um, but but it's, it's, a, it's a constant um, challenge to, to, to find um, journalists and news organizations that are pushing um, back against the status quo on a lot of these groupthink um, uh, reporting issues. What's the hardest part of your job? <laughs> Raising money when when um, you, you know you, you you can't just go to the corporate trowel um, and 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 that you, you you kick dirt in the face of, of the political left uh, and 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 suddenly uh, hard left groups um, like the Tides Foundation who has tons of money won't support you and then you turn around and kick dirt in Monsanto and corporate groups and the right wing and and you know we have twenty articles in the past month. Um, taking on Fox News and misinformation from the far right on everything from vaccines to um, climate change. And suddenly they view you suspiciously. So we're great at making enemies. We're not so good at making friends. And ultimately, um, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's hard to um, raise money in, in, in that. Luckily, we have some great um, foundations like the Templeton Foundation, um, where I just put in two grants in the past week, one focusing on um, misinformation in the developing world in Latin America, Africa, and, and Asia, and how activist groups have infiltrated religious organizations, is Islamic and, um, and, and evangelical and Christian ones, and another focused on um, 
sustainability uh, and, and the role of biotechnology in advancing um, climate change um, uh, solutions in, in agriculture. So is let's let's return to that, and then I want to draw to a close because we've been talking now for a little bit more than an hour. So in, back to the climate change in plants and plant genetics. Then um, one of the things that really fascinates me is this idea of of, of possibility of, of nitrogen fixation, right? That 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 is a is a technique. Where, you know, farmers for for centuries could only use guano, and then we had the Haber Bosch process where they got synthetic ammonia. Um, but the possibility that plants could fix their own nitrogen. It just seems you mentioned the holy grail of you know you pesticide or pest resistance uh, uh, in, uh, of of, all, of any kind, but then increased yield, nitrogen fixation. I mean, what are those? What which I guess the traits that we're going to need to develop in in different crops is going to vary by region. But is there is there one specific set of traits that's going to be the ones that are going to be the real game changers besides? What we talked about in terms of yield, I, I think you, you've hit on the single most important one. Uh, probably the largest amount of pollution um, that we, we get out of agriculture comes from um, uh, from, from from fertilizer, and it not only uh, degrades the soil. We have the uh, runoff in in in, in the waterways, so it's a, so it's an environmental pollution in many ways. It's again a trade off issue. We've utilized it. It's uh, over quite some decades now. It's dramatically helped increase. Um, a yield, and it's been a savior in the developing world, especially, but not without its negative and quite severe environmental consequences. I, I, I think we will, that will happen. Pivot, Pivot Bio is something that people should Google and, and look up. It's one of the leaders um, looking into that. Uh, and uh, there are other companies on the front lines of, of this technology. It will happen. How it will happen, how long it will take to play out, and become something that can be scaled up. That I can't predict. Um, but again, call me a techno op optimist. And, and there are t technological fixes that haven't worked on many things over the years. And optimists have been disabused of their optimism on certain things. But I really believe that um, this is an area that uh, that we will find a solution with. And, and along with yield, it is the, um, um, the, 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 the hope for major solution. The, the ability to reduce that fertilizer input and, and increased yield at the same time. Yeah. yeah, we're definitely going to get it on on pesticides uh, uses. But that, that's that's significant as well. Um, uh, but that but we're, we're far along in that area in, in finding those kinds of um, uh, solutions. But the nitrogen one is is a is a more more of a challenge. Right. And and that it, and that again, for as you pointed out early on, then this the with the climate, the specter of the of the changing climate, more extreme weather, et cetera, that these are going to be the critical it's going to be through genetics, plant genetics, that those are the only ways that we're going to be able to make those kind of breakthroughs that are going to be essential. If I'm, I, 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 this is not a get out of jail free card for um, uh, uh, on the issue of, of, of overusing and, and misusing um, energy. We will have to phase out a lot of fossil fuels, particularly the most uh, carbon intensive ones like coal. So this is not an excuse to not address those other issues. It's just recognizing that we do have some solutions and I would like to see, rather than like when the UN report came out um, a month or so ago about climate change problems that we're facing in, 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 over the short term, um, rather than just saying the sky is falling, which we need to say to some degree, the sky is falling, but, but, but we have solutions as well. And it, the, the documents and the support system for solutions is a lot, um, is a lot smaller um, than, the, um, the, 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 than the loud voices calling for catastrophic um, change and problems. So we, we need voices of solutions and every report on climate change should, should say, here's what we can do in agriculture. Here's what we can do in energy reduction and changes. Here's what we can do. Here's the roles that nuclear energy and uh, clean coal can play, recognizing that, we're, that the developing world is not gonna play to our tune. We gotta do things that are realistic in the real world and, and get things done, not just talk about what we hope to do. So last couple of things, and my guest is John Entine. He is the uh, founder and executive director of the Genetic Literacy Project. It's at geneticliteracyproject.org. Um, so what are you reading? You're sitting in front of your bookshelf there. There's a lot of books behind you, some of them what you wrote. Um, but what's on your nightstand? What kind of, what, what, do you, what do you read when you're not working or are you always working? What, 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 books, are you, what books are you reading now? I, I make it a point to, um, to I, I'm, I'm in an all guy book club, uh, so and, and, and we pretty much have put policy off the table because we uh, we end up 
spending half of our book club talking about policy and debating about, you know, the dangers of Trumpism or whatever the issue happens to be. Um, even though we are, are ideologically quite diverse on many issues, though we do we do share a, a, a general disdain for our former president. But I, 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 I guess I read smart um, nonfiction. I just read the, the Tattooist of Auschwitz, which was a, a book that came out a few years ago, partly based on a memoir, partly um, fictional. Um, what, what was about, the title again? I'm sorry. The, the Tattooist of Auschwitz. Oh, Tattooist of Auschwitz. Okay. Yeah, and it's a story about... Um, uh, someone, uh, uh, a Jew, uh, who went through Auschwitz. It's a true story, a memoir, though it's retold 50 years after the incident, right near his death, um, uh, and after the death of his uh, of his surviving wife, who's one of the major characters in the book. And he faced a, a dilemma that I think uh, helps shed some light on some of the issues that that that, uh, that we're talking about here, in that he was tabbed to be the person who put the tattoos on on um, on incoming. Um, on, 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 on incoming people who were sent often eventually to the crematoria. So in essence, he was a collaborator, but he used those contexts to um, smuggle um, out um, jewels and other things to, to get food to keep um, people within, the, um, within Auschwitz alive. And he, he lived with the fact that he was both a, um, someone who collaborated with the enemy, maybe working with corporations to... Um, uh, to uh, get solutions on issues, um, but he also brought a lot of, of good. And I think that really reflects on the issue that we're talking about here. Sometimes we have to look at cost-benefit analysis and we have to partner with, with people that sometimes we don't agree with all of their tactics, um, but we have to keep our eye on the prize. And he, his eye on the prize was to save people's lives. And that's what our goal is as well. And I think we have to um, think big. So my fiction is really about problem solving in the, in the wider sense. That's that's what I tend to focus on. So, well, that's a good segue maybe to this final question. So what gives you hope? Um, the Breakthrough Institute, um, smart people from the left and the right getting together and talking solutions, people that I might not necessarily be friends with. And the idea that the younger generation, my daughter's 23, is... Um, cares about what, 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 what moves the meter, not about res what resonates purely ideologically. That's a sea change. The younger generation, I think, is much more pragmatically oriented. Um, I don't want to be a, 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 you know, o o overstate the role of technology in improving the world, but we have to be recognized that there, there is a potential for huge innovation advances. And that, that really drives uh, my optimism. And I do think the world will be better rather than worse. Um, um, but I think it takes stepping out by um, solutionists, people like Breakthrough, hopefully like the GLP, that says, here's the way we can do things that are better and, um, and, and not just say um, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Well, that's a good place to stop. Um, thanks, John Intine. Uh, if I mentioned him before, he's the founder and executive director of the Genetic Literacy Project at geneticliteracyproject.org. John, thanks a million for being on the Power Hungry podcast. Thank you. Um, great show and big fan and glad to um, be invited on. And all of you in podcast land, tune in for the next edition. It's going to be good, really good. And if you want to give us a rating on your favorite podcast outlet, five, six, 12, 14 stars, whatever you feel like. Until next time, see you back here. Thanks.